We have uh, all been blessed by God, and we've been spending the past about five weeks or so looking into the reality from Scripture that we have been graciously blessed by God not to be a stagnant pond, but to be a channel of blessing to others. He has blessed us to be a blessing. And I trust that we are having our eyes fully open to this. This morning we're in 2 Corinthians and we're going to look at the ninth chapter. And then together we are going to remember Jesus. This passage leads us ultimately to the cross. Our greatest motivation for giving, in fact, is the cross. Many of us understand here in this room, having someone make a promise to you and them not keep that promise, and how that hurts, how that breaks our heart, or perhaps someone in your family and someone has not kept their promises to a family member and your heart breaks for them. It's devastating. I think if we're all honest, we can admit that there have been those we have made promises to and we have not followed through on our promise. Maybe you were somewhere and you realized, wait a second, didn't I tell somebody I was going to be somewhere? Oh, I was supposed to help them or I was supposed to be there. I forgot. I'm so sorry you were counting on me and I let you down. We don't rejoice in that, do we? As Paul is writing to the Corinthians, that is what he is trying to avoid with them. They made a promise. And he knows them well enough, they are on the way to an intersection of, we meant to do that, Paul, but we just didn't finish it. We just didn't get it done. Oh, we're so sorry. He wants to avoid that. So he is writing to them motivated by love. He's not writing to them as the apostle, and I'll tell you what you're going to do your money with your money, and this is how much you make, and you do this, and I'm an apostle, and you listen to me. That's not how he's writing to them. He is writing to them in the area of stewardship, in the area of finances, but he's writing because he loves them. And he loves those Jewish believers who are suffering in Jerusalem. He does not want the Corinthians to miss out on being part of being a blessing. They know all too well about receiving God's blessing. They're rich. They've been blessed. He wants them to experience being used by God to be a blessing to others. And week in and week out, I just have to praise God for the privilege of serving the Lord in this place, trusting that God is using me to be a blessing to you, all the while knowing that God is using you to be a blessing to me and to my family and to so many others. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. First of all, let's look at the challenge of giving in the first five verses. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come, they come with me and find you unprepared. We, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you have previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. He wants them to be ready. This morning we're going to see why was it appropriate, there's four reasons, why was it appropriate for Paul to write to them and challenge them in giving? And even today, why is it appropriate for a man of God, for a pastor, for a shepherd, 
to challenge the people of God in their giving. Why is that appropriate? Four reasons. First of all, in the first verse, grace giving is God's plan for taking care of His church. Grace giving is God's plan for taking care of His church. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, Paul says it is superfluous for me to write to you. Ministering, it's a word where we get deacon from. Diakonia is the Greek word. It means table waiter. It means to serve. The diaconate does not run the church. Any church model that has deacons who run the church is not biblical. It's a confusion. Deacons are given and deaconesses to the body of Christ to serve the body. The word is to serve. It's to labor. Oh, but it is a high calling to think about that. To have the privilege to pray for and serve and love the people of God in an office. That's why there's a promise given in 1 Timothy 3 to those who serve well. Not to those who just occupy an office. To those who serve well, there's a great reward promise. How is the body to be taken care of? This ministry, this serving? It's through the giving of God's people. The church, we do not solicit Kmart and Kroger and every business in town to help them. Can you help us pay our lights and, and take care of our pastors? No. But if you work at Kmart or you work at Kroger or, Kroger or somewhere in town, what you earn, then we come together as the body of Christ and we give to the Lord and the needs are met. We are not a burden on the community. We are to be a blessing to the community. We're not to be known in the, is in the community as always asking for handouts, handouts, handouts. Oh, here come the church people. They want something from me. Warning, no. Here come the people of God. They must be wanting to give to me. Oh, how much better that is. And what do we want to give to people? The gospel, life, forgiveness. And how can we do that? Through Christ and only Christ who gave for us. Giving is God's plan for taking care of His church. It's how the needs are met. And if you look here, some of you have come out of a Catholic background. And you thought, wait a second, aren't saints people who have been dead for a couple centuries and something has happened? Who are saints? Concerning the ministering to the saints. The Greek word is hagios. It means consecrated ones. It means separated ones. It means holy ones. I had a professor at Liberty who would sign his, his uh, closing emails, holy ones. And it caught me off guard at first. I'm like, yeah, whoa. But he's right. If I'm in Christ, I've been declared righteous. I've been made holy. Have you? Do you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? It's not through something we can do or merit or earn it's what He has accomplished on the cross through His death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. Our only deal in this? To receive. There's no glory in receiving a gift. The glory is to the giver. It's to the one who laid down His life. So who is served? Those who are alive. It's people who were hungry. They weren't dead. They were alive. They needed the ministry of the body to meet their need. So I trust that that is helpful. I had someone ask me that once. Saints, you know, who is this? What does that mean to be in Christ? It means you've been born again. It means you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's how our local needs are met. That's how the pastor's needs are met. Church expenses, outreach. That's how our missionaries, their needs are met. It's through the giving of God's people. This is God's plan. Giving should be eagerly embraced by all genuine believers. Paul says, this is superfluous. I shouldn't even have to write this. This is excessive. You know, how many, how many times do I have to say this? But doesn't that sound like a parent? Right? Hey, did you uh, get up this morning? Yeah, I'm up. Did you make your bed? Oh, no, I forgot. How many times do I have to say this to you, right? Did you put away this? Did you put away that? Did you close the door? Did you do these things? At our house, you have to push your chair in at the table. If we get up from the table and we leave some chicken on the table and one chair is left out, 
There's a certain scoundrel in our house that will find his way on the table. He's a dog. Okay, it's, it's, it's excessive that I should have to say at every meal. Now, before we leave, let's take our plates up to the counter and make sure all the chairs are pushed in. And sometimes I'm met with blank stares by my daughters. And then I come back or we leave and come back and there's the furry creature on the table whining. <laughs> he can't get down. He's been up there for hours. It's too far up. He can't get down. Someone left the chair out. So then I pull the captain dead. Who left the chair out? Well, we all sit in the same spot, so I can tell you left your chair out. Poor dog. It's your fault. Paul is writing, but here a fatherly word to these Corinthians. He's writing, says, you know, I shouldn't have to mention this again, but I want you to be protected. I want you to be involved in this. I'm protecting your honor and your reputation and your name. I know you want to be involved. You said you want to be involved. So I'm reminding you, I'm sending you the leadership that you need. I shouldn't have to be. This is a given. If God has changed you, it should result in a freely being willing to give. If someone's not been saved, they're not, they're not going to be so inclined to give. That's not going to come naturally. But if God has saved you, He has changed your heart. Not only is grace giving God's plan for taking care of His church, but grace giving, the second thing, encourages others to do more for God's glory in verse 2. I know you're willing. Your willingness, the word traveled, and those Macedonians were like, really? If the Corinthians are doing this? Come on, we can get involved. And they got involved and finished their offering. It made us uncomfortable how much they were giving. They were encouraged. And you know what? When we gather together and we give, it encourages others. Your giving, when we come together for a work project, or we go out door to door, or we wash cars, we're encouraged. We're in the fellowship of believers. If we help somebody move, whatever it is, just being alongside of one another encourages one another. So it is with our giving. The Macedonians, they felt this. Do you realize that we as believers, we can either be a great example or we can be a bad obstacle for people. Just this week, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, mega pastor, had to resign his ministry, 15,000 people attend on a weekend due to moral failure. There was one individual, another individual, who had an opportunity to encourage and be an example to thousands, and now, because of moral failure, he is an obstacle to millions who hear another pastor. That's what they are. They're no different than a politician. It's so sad. There's a man who is suffering the consequences of making bad decisions. And no doubt his wife is hurt, his family is hurt, the church is hurting. There's a devastation. Do you realize Paul understood that there's a potential of, after being an example, in turning and becoming an obstacle? Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We need to pay attention to this, beloved. And we do not worship and we do not follow men. There is a danger, and sometimes these things happen because people can easily follow after a person. They can be so enamored with a personality that, you know, they follow someone instead of Christ. And we must be on guard for that. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I referenced this verse last week, verse 26. Paul says, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. So I'm not a shadow boxer. Paul understands he has one life and he wants to make it count for Christ. And I think you know me well enough. That is my disposition in life. That is my prayer. I have one life to live. And by the grace of God, I want to go out guns blazing for the glory of God. I do not want to wait and die with a reserve tank. I want to spend and be spent in the gospel. That is Paul. That's why I like Paul. And if other people came alongside of him and they were wasting his time, John Mark, he would quickly say, I don't have time 
to have someone alongside of me that is going to waste my time. Time is too precious. The ministry is too important. The gospel is too valuable. Souls are in the balance. Figure out what you're living for and declare your side. Right? So what does he say in verse 27? A note of humility here. A note of honesty. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. What was Paul's concern? That after he was the one saying, hey, let's do a good job in giving, that he would not be faithful in giving. That after he said, let's be pure in our living, that for some reason he would fall off the wagon and not become pure in his living. And that he would be disqualified. And disqualified means in in the life of this pastor, I believe uh, that, that stumbled this past week, he's disqualified from ministry. That doesn't mean that there's not grace and forgiveness and mercy. It doesn't mean that God can't ever use him again, but according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, the man of God must be blameless. This office is to be kept free from reproach. Above reproach is the overarching quality. So if a man of God is not blameless, he cannot again serve in the office of pastor. He is to go be served. He is to do differently and be, submit himself to church leadership. Not go through a little time of of, of flogging the back, and then here I am, I'm back, I've been forgiven. Now listen to me. Must be blameless. And Paul said, otherwise I'm disqualified. You understand what it means means to be disqualified. You know? If you're put out of the game and you're sent to the locker room, they don't the referees don't get together in the fourth quarter and say, you know what, it would really be a better game if we had that. The ratings would be better. Let's bring him back out of the locker room. No, he was disqualified. He's done. His game is finished. He did not compete according to the rules. That's what Paul has in mind here. Grace giving is God's plan. Grace giving encourages others, and that's what we want to be as an encouragement, not a stumbling block. The third thing we see that Paul says here, let me challenge in your giving. Grace giving requires thoughtful preparation. It demands that we prepare ourselves. It's not going to happen just by a leftover. You know the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Just a little bit of prevention, just a little bit of put put the little spark out is a whole lot better than having every airplane at your, you know, disposal to take care of a forest fire. No, it'd be much better to put out the little fire. So, You're going to have to be prepared, Corinthians. Community, if we're going to be used by God greatly, we're going to have to be prepared. So Paul, in verse 3, says, Okay, so remember, I sent you the brethren. We don't have to re-preach that again. We looked at it last week. I sent you Titus. I sent you brother number one. Everybody knows him. He loves the gospel. He's, He's known for his praises in the gospel. The other brother, we tested him in everything. He's faithful. Everything that comes into his hand, he does it. So we've sent you the right leadership. Follow them. Verse 4, fix what is broken. To the Macedonians come and you're not prepared, boy, that's going to be bad. We don't want that to happen, Corinthians. And it's going to happen if you don't change your ways. Isn't that the wonderful thing about repentance? That if you're sitting in a service or you're reading your Bible on your own and, and, and you're, you say, wow, I just realized I'm doing this and I, I shouldn't be doing that. Then what can you do? Lord, forgive me of doing that. I'm not going to do that anymore by your grace. Help me to walk this way. Or you hear a sermon and you say, I didn't realize I'm supposed to be doing this. I I didn't even know that. Lord, forgive me for not doing that. Help me. Let me be faithful and I'll, I'll obey you. It's repentance. It's just stop sinning. Start obeying. That's so simple that sometimes we're like, well, that's too easy. That is just too easy. Yeah, don't buy the lie of Satan. He would have you enslaved. Follow godly leadership. Fix what is broken. If they listen to Paul, then the Corinthians are going to be prepared. And if the Corinthians are prepared, then when Paul shows up, he's not going to be ashamed on their behalf. He's going to rejoice. If the Macedonian delegation comes with Paul, they're not going to be ashamed. There's going to be no embarrassment. It's not going to be awkward and uncomfortable. Oh, we're glad. We heard you guys are giving an offering. We're going, oh, we can't wait to see it. 
Oh, yeah, we were going to get on that. Brother so-and-so was going to do that. Oh, yeah, weren't we about to? Awkward, right? You, you mean you're not ready? You, you knew, you, we heard you knew, and the Jerusalem Christians, we heard you were going to give. Yeah, we were going to do something about that, but we just, we just didn't get around to it. Oh, this is embarrassing. But when everybody engaged in this offering, they're going to hug, they're going to cry, they're going to pray together, they're going to love one another, they're going to fellowship together, and that delegation that would be then sent on to Jerusalem is joined together. We're one in this, and they're going to send them off. We did this together by the grace of God. It wasn't the Corinthians, it wasn't the Macedonians, it was the body of Christ coming together to accomplish what needed to be done. John Piper, he quotes Robert Murray McShane, a Scottish pastor. And it, it's an interesting quote. Robert Murray McShane, he died at the age of 29 in 1843. And he wrote this down, he, speaking to his congregation, talking about, what about your heart change? He had a ministry to the poor, but he was concerned about those who named the name of Christ in the congregation, but they had no compassion. They were not willing to give and help. And he identified that to be a problem because they were lacking a display of mercy. This is what McShane wrote. He said, I am concerned for the poor, but more for you. I know not what Christ will say to you in the great day. I fear there are many hearing me who may know well that they are not Christians because they do not love to give. To give largely and liberally, not grudging at all, requires a new heart. An old heart, listen to this, would rather part with its life blood than its money. Oh, my friends, to that kind of a person, he says, enjoy your money. Make the most of it. Give none away. Enjoy it quickly, for I can tell you, you will be beggars throughout eternity. Why? Because you love your money more than you do God. That's what he's saying to his people. Our money doesn't lie, does it? It's what I said last week. Our giving is a thermometer. It tells us where we are spiritually. Paul's writing to them, fix what's broken, Corinthians. I know, I know you want to get involved in this. Come on, do what's right. And finish what you started. A couple of times here he says that you're ready. I want you to be ready. He ends verse 5, be ready as a matter of generosity. Be ready. The fourth thing we see is grace giving is most generous when it results from grateful hearts. That it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Now, the wrong motive for giving is that you're obligated. That's what I said last week with Henry Ford. He, he was obligated then to give 45,000 more than he intended to originally give. Don't be like Ebenezer Scrooge. Don't live that way. Greed or selfishness is a deadly enemy of grace giving. And the illustration of the Macedonians, it displays the right order and heart attitude. You remember right there, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. Do you remember the order of their giving? And not only as we hoped but they, the Macedonians, gave themselves where? To the Lord. And after they had given themselves to the Lord, 2 Corinthians 8, 5, then to us by the will of God. What is God's will? Is that you give your life, first of all, to God. And if we give our all to God, God, I'm yours then what happens is, that sounds subjective. It sounds out there and kind of surreal. But what happens is then, I'm engaged to people around me. He says, great, you've given your heart and life to me, then serve those people right there, the ones you can see, the ones that are looking at you. 
the ones that sit in, in front of you and behind you and beside you, the ones in your family, your neighbors that Pastor Jamie's been talking about, and you go, then make a difference in their lives. Your faith becomes real. So we are not saved by works. It doesn't work this way. I'm going to go work and try to bless and serve people all around me. How am I doing, God? Am I earning favor with you? No. It's for by grace you're saved through faith. The Macedonians say, here we are. All our sin, all our shame, we give it to you. We receive Christ. That's all the difference in the world. Have you done that? Have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Has He saved your soul? And if so, then you are saved and I am saved for good works. And a Christian who lives out their life, oh, thank the Lord, I'm saved, I'm saved. It's wonderful that I'm saved. But they do not serve others. They are missing out on the purpose of their life. They're rolling down the freeway with something in that back tire. And they can just turn the radio up a little louder or they can fix what is wrong. And the ride can change. What kind of person are you? The best giving results from grateful hearts. Paul says, here's your positive motivation. After you've given yourself to God, give yourself to others. And let this be displayed in generosity. The Greek word is eulogia. It's where we get the word eulogy. It's blessing. It's a praise. It's that, Corinthians, you could leave a legacy here. Your giving can outlive you. It can go beyond your small life. When you give it to God, watch and see what He will do with it. Speaking, fine speaking, praise, or commendation. So Paul is challenging these Corinthians to engage in grace giving. And that would allow them to become of this great sacrifice of praise to God. We have been blessed to be a blessing. And what I believe is, is that God is and desires to do something great. But you know what it's going to require? It's going to require that we as believers, we have a mindset from God. And we say, I want my life to be more than just about me. I want to give to leave a legacy. So when we give, we give it to the Lord. We give it for Him. And we, as best as we can, we manage it as good stewards. And right now we are preparing as a congregation to say, how are we going to have a parking lot of our own? How are we going to have a place where we can meet, where there's room for people to come in? How is that going to happen? It's going to come when we bind together to do something that is a eulogy of praise to the Lord. Grace giving is God's plan for taking care of His church. Grace giving encourages others to do more for God's glory. Grace giving requires thoughtful preparation. And grace giving is most generous when it results from grateful hearts. I trust that is your disposition this morning. Now what about joy? How do we have joy in giving? Look at verse 6. Let's begin there. Paul says, But this I say, He who sows sparingly will also reap how? Sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap how? Bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves what kind of a giver? A cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having uh, all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving might want to underline that word there, through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many, here it is again, thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, 
who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Read the last verse with me. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Paul's five, Paul, Paul's five principles to maintain joy. Number one, give liberally. Verse six, you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. It's the law of the harvest. Paul, he says, let's look at the farmer. If you go out and you take a handful of seed and the farmer goes out and he plants a handful of seed in his field, what can he expect to harvest in the fall? He's not going to need a truck. He's not going to need a tractor. He's not going to need a wheelbarrow. All he's going to need is a Kroger bag. And he's done. And if he's thinking, you know, I just want to be done in the fall, then that's the way to do it. Just go put one kernel in the ground and your harvest, you don't need to give anybody a job. You don't need to put any insurance on your car. You don't need to order any more diesel fuel. You don't need to do anything. The problem is you're not going to pay any bills. And you've got all those acres of land out there but if you only put one kernel in the ground, yeah, but I'm going to save all that grain in the barn. I don't want to waste it in the ground. Then you're not going to get any return. It's the law of the harvest. It's the law of the harvest. You reap according to what you sow. You reap later than you sow. You reap more than you sow. And you reap according to what you sow. Here's the deal, beloved. Whatever you're putting in the ground, whatever I'm putting in the ground, we're going to see it again. And you're going to see more of it. But it's going to come later. So what does the farmer do? He takes that precious grain, he goes out, and he puts it carefully in the ground. He entrusts it. It looks like, what are you going to do? It's going to die. It's going to go in the ground and die. Are you wasting it? No, I'm investing it. I'm planting it. And I will see it again. I am trusting the Lord of the harvest who established the law of the harvest. I will co commit it to Him and He will bring it back in return. Give liberally. How are you sowing? How are you giving to the Lord? Whatever we're putting in the ground, that is what we're going to see again. Not only are we to give liberally, but also give lovingly. Verse 7, God loves, what kind of a giver does God love? A cheerful giver, hilarious. He loves it to be joyous. So, do you find that at tax season? You just go April 15th, what, two days? And you're just going to go to the mailbox, woohoo, take that, yes, I get to live in this great land. Now, perhaps we should possess a little bit more of an attitude like that. We have freedom and we have a great country and we love our nation. But it's a little harder because someone is telling you this is what you will give, period. And if you don't, you're going to be in trouble, right? But when it comes to giving, no one's telling you here is what you're going to give. When it comes to our giving, God leads us and we come saying, God, you've given me everything and I get to give back to you. And, and here's the deal. If I've been loved by God and I have, then He's my Father. My love is going to be in line with what He loves. And if He loves a cheerful giver, then I'm going to want to be a cheerful giver. He's going to give me the ability to be a cheerful giver. So no matter what I do in my stewardship, He's going to enable me to do it joyfully. And not just drag through and suck it up and just, let's grin and bear it, and I'll just keep serving as a trustee for the longest, you know. You know? Start to sound like the Deuce of Hazard guy. Do what we do joyfully. Serve Him joyfully. Give joyfully. Be good stewards. He's the one who is able. Don't let your giving... You've got to be careful. You can watch TV and you see one commercial fade into the next of a limping little animal going this way, of a child over here. And you can want to help all of these causes and, and give and give and give. Where's that money going to? What is that organization? What do they stand for? Is the money going? What Be careful that you know where you're giving. But we're best motivated when we're motivated by love. It's what God loves. Thirdly, give worshipfully. We see this in verses 8 through 11 that our giving must always be God-centered. 
We give knowing that it is God who is able. God is the one who is all sufficient. That's what Paul says. That God is able. Verse 8. Aren't you thankful for that? We shouldn't miss that. My God is able. Able to do what? He's able to meet your need. He's able to save your soul. He's, a, he's able to cleanse you from sin. He's able to give you victory. Oh, Pastor, you don't know what I deal with. No, but He does. And my Bible says, and if you're holding the Bible in your lap, it says, God is what? Able. Can we say that together? God is able. He is able. He is all sufficient. Now, you may not be, and I may not be. Most of the time, we aren't. But God is able. Paul writes in Philippians 4.19, he says, And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He is able. If we're going to be, uh, have our needs met, it's because God is able. If we're going to be content with what God supplies for us, then it's going to be because God is able. If I'm going to be content with what He supplies... Uh, Bill's favorite scripture is 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, Paul writing, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, Most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God is able. And Paul was good with that. If we're going to be willing to share to meet the needs of others and the needs of this ministry, it is because God is the one who enables us. He is able. So Paul, he grounds this in Psalm 112, verse 9, of the character of a righteous man. That the, the righteous man, he disperses abroad. He doesn't live hoarding. It's mine. He invests. He uses it. He pays his bills. He shares with the poor. He's kind. He knows what to do, to do with his finances and with his wealth. And the righteousness of the upright endures forever. This individual will receive the blessing of the Lord both now and for all eternity. It's not just focused on give to God and receive blessing now, health, wealth, prosperity. We give knowing that His God is not only able, but He is provident. Verses 10 and 11 tell us how He's laid out the whole process. Where does the seed come from that the farmer gets to plant in the spring? God, right? All seed, all life comes from God. He's the one that has ordained the process of life. And what a blessing that is. Can you imagine if you planted one kernel of corn and you got two back? Better take care of those two. It's going to take a long time before you feed anybody. But how He is planned sovereignly planned the law of the harvest. Plant one apple seed and you get an apple tree. One acorn and you get an oak tree. Boy, my God is amazing. He is able. He is omnipotent. I want to read another quote. This, is, this book, Don't Waste Your Life by John Piper. If you haven't read it, I've given it to many of our graduates. I trust that they have read it. Because that's my prayer as their pastor is that they don't waste their life. Fitting title to the book, don't you think? John Piper writes about how we handle loss. You know, handling loss says a lot about us, doesn't it? It says a lot about who our treasure is. John Piper writes, he says, The greatest joy in God comes from giving His gifts away, not in hoarding them for ourselves. It is good to work and have. It is better to work and have in order to give. God's glory shines more brightly when He satisfies us in times of loss than when He provides for us in times of plenty. The health, wealth, and prosperity gospel swallows up the beauty of Christ and the beauty of His gifts and turns the gifts into idols. The world is not impressed when Christians get rich and say thanks to God. 
They are impressed when God is so satisfying that we give our riches away for Christ's sake and count it gain. I love that. Fourthly, we're to give corporately. Give corporately. Giving in the fellowship of believers should bring unity in the body of Christ. And you know, we have watched in this church, in this exact area, in the last several years, we have watched our body tighten together when we come together even for a business meeting. And we come together and we say, oh God, you've been so good to us. You've been faithful to us. You have blessed us. And we are seeing a like-minded, spirit-led fellowship to where we are passionate about being a channel of blessing and not fighting over things, but how can we best glorify God and be used by Him to impact, to reach the world from Richmond? That was my appeal. So here we are, 2006, on this day, was when the church voted to call me to come and serve as a pastor. Easter Sunday, the following Sunday, I stood right there and said, lock arms as we join together to reach the world from Richmond. And many of you were there that day. Some of you weren't even saved that day. And you've come to faith in Christ, and you're in a process of discipleship now. We're not done yet, in case we didn't know that. There's more people. There's more to be done. There are more broken lives to be changed and healed. And it's only through the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We're not finished. We're only getting started. And it's good. And it's a blessing. And it's encouraging. And we love the work of the Lord. Give corporately. And what is Paul trying to do? He's trying to encourage them. Get involved in this, Corinthians. Don't miss out on this. Because this is going to produce opportunities of thanksgiving to the Lord. And he's writing to them. And he says, generous giving is going to meet the needs. And that's going to bring praise to God. And generous giving in verse 13 in the church, it demonstrates a visible proof of the gospel. And that's going to bring glory to God. Corinthians, when you get involved in this gift and you join in, that's going to be a testimony. They're going to say, oh, your confession in the gospel has resulted in you giving of your finances. That's right. We want to make a difference. In verse 14, generous giving in the church unites believers in prayer and in kinship because of God's grace that is put visibly on display. Their prayer for you. They long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. They, are, they haven't even met you yet, and they love you. They cannot wait to see you. If they join and they, oh, we've, we're here, and we traveled, and we have our gift, and uh, you're not ready. That's going to be anticlimactic. That will be a buzzkill, right? That's going to be, whoa. But if they join together, and you come, and you know what it is to have done what you said you were going to do? Yes, we're ready. We're ready to go then there's going to be a time of joy and fellowship and sweetness. And it's all going to be centered where it ends it on verse 15. Number five, give thankfully. What more can be said than thanks be to God for His indescribable gift? All of our grace giving begins and ends with God. All praise, all thanksgiving is to the Lord Jesus alone. God is the one who willingly and graciously gave Jesus so Paul is writing to them, and he's writing like a coach. And he's saying, come on, I know what you could do. I know the potential you have. You may not understand it, but I do. I want you to not miss this. Come on. Get engaged. Get involved. I shared in the early service, Coach Keith was in the back, and I've watched him coach young people in gymnastics. I've watched him coach my daughters and try to explain to them, here's this move. You have to trust me. This is what you have to do. This is how you have to do it. This is what you've got to trust me. Do this. And they look like, oh, I don't get it. You know, and They hang on, and they don't trust, and they trust, until they finally get it, and they do it. And then suddenly, it all transfers. All that joy, all that excitement transfers from the coach to the, to the little athlete. And they stick it, and their face lights up. They're like, 
I did it. I got a back handspring. I did it all. The coach wants them to experience the joy of completing, of finishing, of doing what they didn't think they could do. Trust me. Don't miss out on this. Get engaged in this. Don't let life go by. Paul is writing to them. He's coaching them. He's challenging them. He's not dominating over them. Would you want a coach like that? No. Paul, he tenderly shepherds them. And can there be a greater example than that of Christ? Beloved, let's give liberally. Let's give lovingly, worshipfully, corporately. And all of it is to be done. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. And it brings us right here to the Lord's table. This is where we remember Jesus. That He died. He didn't say, I love you, and louder, I love you. He died. So that we could be forgiven. And again this week, another tragedy in a high school. And how those testimonies begin to come out of certain individuals who put their own, one young man, I saw him, and he was next to a girl and he shoved her out of the way. And that 16 year old took the knife and stabbed him. You don't hear of that often. But would you do that for a criminal? Would you take the stabbing? Would you take the gunshot for someone who was condemned to die? Because that's what Jesus did for you and for me. And it's so simple. There's no salvation here, beloved. It's only a picture. The juice, the bread, it's representative. The indescribable gift is Jesus. He died once for all. And if you're here this morning and you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus, salvation isn't here in these tins, in the trays. It's in Christ. And I invite you to trust in Him. When we observe communion, it is for those who have been saved, those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus. It's for those who have been baptized in this church or in a church of like faith. You have followed the Lord in believer's baptism. And then it's also for those that there's not unrepentant sin in your life. Believers, you've been saved and baptized, but there's not an area of sin that you say, I'm not, I'm not dealing with that. I don't care who tells me. I know it's wrong, but I will keep doing it. Don't partake of the Lord's table. Confess and forsake your sin. Follow Jesus. And then 1 Corinthians 11 says, partake of the Lord's table. We will tarry. We will wait for one another. I would like to ask the men to come and prepare. Ginger to come on the keyboard. Come at this time. I will pray. And then I'm going to hand over and Pastor Jamie is going to oversee this time of the Lord's table. It is the Lord's table. It's not the senior pastor's table. This table is to the church, to those who have been saved, to those who have been baptized, to those who are obedient. If you're here without Christ, don't leave today. Trust in Him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, You are the indescribable gift. And through Your death, burial and resurrection, we are given life, everlasting life for all who trust in You alone. Help us, Lord, in our stewardship to fully realize we've been blessed to be a blessing. Make us a blessing today. And as we remember Christ, 
his work, his life, his ministry. We remember the work of Christ in our lives. We repent of sin. And we rejoice as we await your return, Lord. Take this time now in the quietness of these moments and purify us. Make us holy. Make us more like you, Jesus. In your name we pray.